Yeah, one thing just uh, wanted to uh, say is that most of us have been thinking about students with their past income. So like for example, it's like giving a need-based scholarship to an IIM or an ISB graduate and most of them will get a 15 lakh uh, job after graduation. So when we are looking at these uh, students as potential customers, you have to look at what they will earn once they finish training. So I think at least one uh, partial mindset change has to be there from that aspect. And uh, secondly, even students will take risk because they understand the capability the best. No, none of us will be able to analyze how driven or how capable a particular individual is. So once you let them take the risk by you know letting them choose the courses or how much loan they want to uh, take, I think half the problems will get solved in terms of the matching uh, issue. So, so questions from the audience. Uh, uh, for, for the panels, I have a you know a comment on the the vouchers thing. I think that's a, a method of uh, basically uh, you want to facilitate that whoever wants to acquire skill they will take the voucher and go to the training institution, deploy that and get the training. But the operational difficulties. You know, is the question that are we assuming that everybody, every citizen gets a voucher and they can go? The the next question is that. Um, uh, is it not vulnerable to the same problem that we faced with the national distribution methodology and all that, Pr fair price uh, kind of thing? I think the critical question is that, yes, there is, there is a potential for jobs. There are, you know, employers uh, who want to, you know, uh, take these candidates, and there are candidates who want to get trained and get there. Now, uh, like the, I made a small observation that you also have to pay for their opportunity cost. What it means? If somebody is looking for a job, he has to invest at least the, his opportunity cost amount there. What is a bottleneck is that if he has to go to a nearest town or a place, that living cost for that 30 days or 40 days becomes the thing. So I think that's only a means, but uh, that still does not address the real critical issue of understanding what is this candidate is interested in, whether he is capable of taking the training program, and then how do you handhold him, and then show the market. That's what it meant. Uh, question to uh, Mr. Satya as well as uh, Praveen. Uh, one of the challenges with financing is how do you de-link financing from marketing and sourcing? So MFIs usually are sought after to do these loan programs because they have a captive base of borrowers. You could market it and so on. And at the branch level, the manager sells the aspirations a bit more higher. So the guy who gets the job at the end of the day goes there and he sees there's an aspiration level and that directly affects the loan payment. So how do you, I mean, what is your experience in delinking marketing? Should MFIs or the mobilizers market and keep the financing separate? I think you can, we can do that. See uh, how MFIs operate. It's not that they will go and say that, okay, do you want a loan? I will give a loan. It's not like that. If MFI is there, and people know that this MFI can give a loan for this purpose, they will come and ask. And the MFI would have their own way of appraising the loan. So we, we should not draw conclusions from the past experience of some institutions and some locations, etc. But as microfinance institution, they'll be interested in looking at the candidate. In fact, actually microfinance institutions would have the advantage of knowing whether this candidate is a serious candidate enough for this training program. As a trainer, you may not be knowing that because microfinance institutions have the history of the family <coughs> they would have seen the candidate a couple of times. They will get the information from the friends and uh, others, and they'll do a better judgment whether this is the right loan to give or not. Yeah, so my question was, once the student's aspirations are not met at the job, that immediately starts affecting the loan repayment. So how do you get that mindset to somebody saying, boss, this 10,000 is for you to get trained, irrespective of how the job goes about, you have an obligation to pay. Just like the standard microfinance loan, irrespective of whether your business goes bust or not, you have an obligation to pay. So how do you... No, first of all, we have to uh, agree that it's not a standard microfinance loan. I'm putting, I'm seeing from the other side. The candidate is coming, and I'm seeing an opportunity here. I want to undergo this training program. After that, I see a prospects for me. I want a loan and you give a loan, I see very risk, risk, less risk there. Because candidate is approaching you, you are appraising thing. It's a slow process. But once you give a confidence to people 
that for their future, if they want to invest some money, they do not have money, but there is a resource, there is an institution to provide that resource, that's how it goes. I absolutely so see no risk. That's why I say that if you have to finance for the self-employment ventures, there's a very little risk involved because there's not much of floating happening. The other dimension which people are also using is they are putting a filter on where is that the, the person is getting paid. Right, so if it is a good quality training organization, then, you know, the probability of, you know, that person getting a good job and, you know, meeting aspirations and having the ability to repay becomes much higher. Right, so that is the other filter. And to your question about whether people are actually separating out marketing and, uh, you know, uh, financing, yes. Right? I mean, so there is the training organization which is responsible for marketing, and there is the bank or the microfinance institution which is assessing the credit worthiness of that individual and his ability to repay. Right? So, in some sense, it is separate. Can I, have sure. uh, I think the issue that you are highlighting is more of collection. So, it's true that, okay, I, when I go to ask for a loan for vocational training, I'm making that choice myself. But if I don't get a good job, and uh, if I do, I'm not able to earn enough to repay the loan, so why would I then repay the loan? The issue is that collecting back the loan that has been made, right? And this is one area where you can see the government having a sort of better hand than private agencies. You remember Citibank, uh, people uh, collect, collect, trying to collect the cars back, uh, people who did not repay the car loans, right? And became a huge, huge fiasco for that, right? Uh, and I think it will be difficult for any private agency to actually uh, enforce this contract, right? particularly when you're put there talking about poor people from very poor areas. Uh, so I think state has to, maybe that's the one area where you can have government agencies uh, which are in charge of collecting laws on behalf of the private parties. And instead of giving money uh, to the banks to underwrite their loans, it is better to spend that money in building capacity of the government to recollect the loans. <laughs> Part there's a question, uh, you know, this is to do with the skill launcher. I think it's a, it will solve a lot of issues, you know, it, it is what I think. But in a scaled model, you know, what are the challenges you see uh, in terms of, you know, for example, I need to meet the initial action agenda. I was just wondering if Gauri signs a check and gives it a part for upping your your pilot from 15,000 to 1 million learners. It solve a lot of problems, actually. So, what challenges you see in... <laughs> so what are the challenges you see in a scale model? Uh, things like monitoring, things like, you know, is... I think, see, we run a virtual pilot for 400 students. Yeah, right. so That is our experience, Schools, yeah. you know. Right? And I think we have been thinking very hard about the uh, issues of scaling up. Right? And one of the projects we have been thinking about in skill sector is supposed to be much larger uh, to be able to address those issues up front as opposed to doing a small pilot and then again thinking about the scaling problems. And I think there are issues, there is no doubt. Uh, but what we think that if you design uh, appropriate, what's the word? Virtual marketplace, uh, that's what we have been calling it, right? Which goes, something I think we heard from Gujarat experience, uh, how they have been created that uh, portal, right? If you add few components to that, uh, it is possible to create not foolproof, a relatively foolproof system uh, of voucher distribution. So anybody who gives a voucher, it could be government, or could be a CSR uh, program of the corporate, uh, to the person who gets the voucher, how the voucher gets to the institution, and how does the institution then encash the voucher. Right? I think it's possible to design a system. Uh, and to think about it, uh, two companies in India, Sudexo and Eden Red, right? that's the business they run, that's the primary business they have is to design these vouchers, distribute them, collect them, and, and cast them for the vendors. Right? So it's not impossible. So they have been doing it, not just in India, around the world. Uh, so if you apply that idea, convert into sort of more technology-based platform, it becomes cost-effective as opposed to what they currently do in terms of the actual paper voucher they distribute. Then I think it's possible to meet some of these challenges. Is there a scale model being thought of somewhere? <coughs> We're doing a pilot. Then, uh, yeah, yeah pilot I'm just saying yeah. what what next, you know, so just kind of... I guess think she said we need to have patience, right? No, <laughs> at the same time, I think the biggest challenge, I mean, the voucher is, I think, a great system which provides for choice, 
right? I mean, the challenge I think with the voucher is how to be uh, bringing the sustainability element to it, right? I mean, who is paying for the voucher? If it is still a grant kind of a thing, then we are just replacing a product by another product, right? Yeah, with, more it, it, yeah, with higher level of efficiency, with more choice, right? To the individual, which empowers that's them. That's important. Yeah. It leaves the choice of the learner. Is there, exactly. The yeah, exactly. Choice of the learner and the point about repayment. I think in the pilot that we are structuring, and Bhubna, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is an L, there is a model of repayment from the employer ecosystem. And, and before we start getting into all the repayments, into your question about, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do you collect and aspirations, let's, let me put something in context here. We're talking two to three times a monthly wage as the loan amount. In, in financing terms, it's not very large. Ticket size is not very large. So the way we approach this business is, we're not looking at one individual, we're not assessing individual risk. We're okay losing money. I mean, don't quote me outside, but it's, it's, not, it's not very large. So because by the time we are saying the risk gets transferred from the training institute to the employer, and the guy takes two, three months to realize his aspirations are not met, I'm done with 60% of my uh, repayment. So, so, so it's a very different model. And the second other important point is you have to think of this, unlike a microfinance, it's a taxi cab relationship. You get in and get out, and you don't want to see that cab again. Unlike in the microfinance, you're hoping the guy comes back for a loan. Only then he has an incentive to repay. Here, I don't want, I don't want the guy to come back. One guy gets one loan in my system. Otherwise, the training institute or someone's done, not done the right job. So there's a question for Praveen. Um, when you say the risk is borne by the training provider until it's borne by the employer, can you elaborate on that? What so that so dropout risk. The way to think about it is, so the guy enrolls. Um, for training, and I transfer the money to um, India Skills, and it's a three-month training program. The guy drops out in a month. Then what happens, right? So there are various ways to structure this risk. Like I said, okay, then they can, there could be a contractual um, risk obligation, or I could say, you finish your training, you place the guy, give me the details of his employer, and then I'll uh, send you the training amount. But before you do all of this, we agree that this is the amount. And this is what we do. That in your current pilot, how do you do the second stage handover? You sign with India Skills, and when they finally place them, you said it gets transferred to the employer. So, so then now, so then we work with the employer. Okay, so India Skills doesn't have this responsibility. No, 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 no. Getting absolutely, absolutely, right. absolutely. Because as a training institute, at least in my view, you should be in business if you have, if you can back yourself to back, uh, pick the right person, train the person, and find the person a job. So you're not adding another problem no, no, to the no, training no, provider apart from like the <laughs> 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 You know, on a scale, I'm just curious, I, I know you tend to want to kind of get to the rate of interest issue, that's fair enough. So what is it that you're charging for? Because the risk at all times is covered. So other than processing... Uh, Why is, how is the risk covered? The risk is not covered so for the... No, no, that's a three-month training. The, the dropout risk is covered. The repayment risk is not covered. The dropout risk is covered from the training provider. Well, if he's got a job, then chances are that the repayment, once an employer agrees, at least in three months, is pretty much covered. No. New York, uh, tag on your question. Uh, tag on your question. What is the expectation of placement success of the training provider? Is it 80%, 90%, 50%? At what level would you engage training partner to work with you? So the way we... Uh, the reason why we designed the system this way is I think there will be a natural self-selection of training institutes that have a very high percentage of placements coming into our system because I'm, we're very clear we're not going to be working with all training institutes, Correct. right? So our target is 100. Now then it's up to the marketplace to tell me what is the threshold for us to be in business. Maybe it's 100, maybe it's 95, maybe it's 75. But our target is 100%. You have to place 100% of your um, uh, students in jobs. I think then by default you're killing the scalability question because you know that 100% correct supply there's a huge order. Absolutely, which is which is why I, I, I you know we're not uh, we're not saying that we are here to solve the countries or NSDC's 500 million target. So, uh, Amit, sir, uh, sorry, I don't work in the space at all, so it might be a very naive question. All, all I'm trying to do is get a sense of what are we really talking about, uh, what's the basis for this discussion, right? So to me, it seems that the fundamental question is about uh, the problem of 
uh, of starting off new training institutes. The reason I say is the following. Uh, let's assume the students are motivated. Okay, so there's no issue about moral hazard on their part, no incentive problems. And I see it at ISB students. You know, they've taken some loan, they've, they've signaled their, their motivation through that. So if it's not about student motivation, it's about uh, the institutes and, and say students don't have money to pay for it. You know, they're unemployed and so on. So if that's the case, then uh, if it's an established training institute, let's go with that file, then perhaps the banks should be able to figure out are they loan worthy or not, looking at the track records of, of these training institutes. Right? So either we're talking about new training institutes who therefore who haven't established a reputation yet, or we don't know if banks have the, have the ability to analyze institutions and see if they're loan worthy or not. Right? Is that really what the whole problem of financing boils down to? Yeah, it's, it's essentially that the banking system cannot be relied upon to do this. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it, that the loan, ticket size of the loan is so small. The ticket size is so small, it, it absolutely does not make economic sense for State Bank of India or Punjab National Bank to actually be working with training institutes and disbursing 10,000 rupee loans. Actually, uh, I would have a different, sorry. Yeah. Banks are starting yeah. to do this. Now. In fact, I didn't yeah. talking about, talking yeah. about loans to the institution, the training institution, right? No. No, no, this is loans to the institution. This would be very financial. It's like an institution loan. No, but not to school. I'm not talking about the trainees getting money. I'm saying, look, give the money to the institutions that provide the training. That can be substantial, right? Those are not. Uh, that NSDC is doing well. So, I think it's a problem really the banks don't do that and therefore we need institutions like NSDC specializing. No, I, think that's I, think what I, I think it started with a different point, right? That the trainees have intent but don't have money. How does that, how does training pay the institution for the service? That's the question. How do you know? So, how do training institutions get money? NSDC. Typically from. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I think Praveen's model ensures that the training institutes put their money where their foot is. Now, uh, you know, so the some, somewhere people have to take risks based on their confidence to place people. Now, the training institute should bring equity to take that risk. They don't need NSDC money. Well, you get equity to take that risk. Your quality of the training you do is so good that you're confident that 70, 80, 90 percent of the other students will get placed. I think one, uh, one uh, point here is that uh, all of us are putting the student on a very uh, high moral uh, uh, platform as such. <laughs> Students basically I think are the biggest beneficiary in this entire system and they carry the least risk I think. They basically have the information about the capabilities, they can try and get into an institute, they can not study and they will drop out, they can, institute can give them a job and they will not take it up, they can go to the employer and they quit in three months because they don't like the food. At every stage, basically, student carries the least amount of risk in the system. So why this entire Maybe, conference was... Can I, can I add to that point? So I was going to say that, you know, uh, would we expect an uh, academic institution giving a degree like an MBA or BTEC carry that risk for education exactly. loans? Exactly. Would we ever expect that from a... But that's why it's not for profit. Because people are not going to go out there. What? That's why it's not for profit. Educational institutions are not for profit. Okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is that, you know, end of the day, the institution cannot be asked to carry the risk alone because so many factors go into the matter of whether somebody stays with the job, gets a job, doesn't get a job. See, I think you'll price the risk. You'll price the risk, which is I expect 5% of the kids, 10% of the kids to drop out. And I'll have this loss. I'm making it up by pricing, by, by pricing the fees accordingly. Yeah. And I'll, I'll spend a lot more time choosing the kind of students I take. Yeah. Whereas today it is, uh, you know, I'm a franchisee and I need 1,000 kids. That's my target, I'm going to take 1,000 kids. The, the, the manager on the, on the front, he's just, you know, we have, we have seen that it's some, some of the largest training companies in India, education companies in India. The, the franchisee so goes and just hires uh, any amount of kids. In fact, uh, for Talent Sprint and uh, NSGC themselves uh, uh, launched that loan product with uh, Central Bank. So while structuring, one of the issues that we kept facing was that imagine if we have a free-flowing loan market, will the training provider just go out and keep filling the classroom? Because students don't have to do anything, just start taking loans from the bank, right. fill the classroom and just get students out in the market without jobs. Yes, the bank goes so, out of business. Yeah. So, 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 so that was one of the biggest issues that we had, that students basically come and you can offer them food and everything, fill your classrooms and you know, five years uh, you make your money and then banks will suffer. 
so there what we try to do is get the training provider rather than a penalty as such or taking a risk we have that 10% money will come back to the training provider it's as good as 10% addition to your margins right for a student so we try to the transaction costs are higher with putting these systems in place but that was the entire idea of uh, so training, training provider is on the book as well yeah the money to some extent on the default that is the point is so so how it works comes in there yeah. 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 so you have 100 rupee loan being given where the margin money of student the 10 rupees will be in the bank 10 rupees from the training provider will be in the bank so you have 20% default guarantee there itself and if any yeah. foundation or any government wants to do it put 10 more rupees for example as a default guarantee so you have 30% default protection. covered there itself in the bank till the repayment happens and the bank has to take some 10 15 percent risk so where else will you find almost 40 to 50 percent of your defaults getting covered in the product and everybody gets the money back if the loan is repaid in the end so that was the entire idea that we thought of so if you have 100 percent default guarantee you have the voucher conceptually so so idea is that if we can get a lot of lenders into the market students have start getting choices and there are multiple structures that can be created. If you have a cash collateral with 10 rupees, you can give out 100 rupees worth of loan. If you do, a, for example, a corporate guarantee with 1 rupee, you can give out 100 rupees worth of loan. So your money doesn't get stuck and you can still catalyze a big uh, market. So I have a question for uh, Mr. Sataya. Are you, since you've already studied the market, are you extending some of these loans to your sister organization, be able? Uh, yes, we are. Yeah, but last 12 months has not been paid. Right. Yes, we are. Because that's where really, you know, it will become very, very clear for the industry. Yeah. Because there is no moral hazard or no risk of transparency. So that's. We are employed for about four to five such collaborations. Quick question for Gauri. How is the Central Bank of India experience working? <laughs> How's the very <laughs> short points? <laughs> exactly. So it's been good to take some lessons from that. That's yes. The um, I think you know there are very different kind of models that we are trying to experiment with in terms of just the structure of the default guarantee fund. With the central bank, there is one kind of model that we are working with, right? Um, and it is, I mean, uh, Shantanu, uh, as you say, it's a so point. It's taken some time to you know just take off for the simple reason that. I mean, we were just trying to get a structure right, right? But uh, the uh, talent sprint on its own had put in money and was uh, actually giving out loans to students on the backing of the uh, central bank product. And um, you know, I mean, coming to and that links to the point on whether this is something that is going to work with banks, right? My very strong point of view is that it is for the simple reason that the banks are they have aggregated. Um, units to go to in the form of training providers, right? So they take a risk on the training provider to say that I will lend to all students who are coming to XYZ training provider because this training provider is offering X percent placement which I am satisfied with, right? So the operational costs go down significantly because they are not having to go door to door, you know, giving out the loan. They go to a single entity and, and dish it up. Right? So is there enough track record built up for this kind of analysis? You have to take the lead, get yeah. burnt and figure it out. The banks want banks assume a twenty percent default as a kind of worst case scenario, right? Or they think that's likely to happen. So in this case a ten percent uh, you know default guarantee has come from NSDC to the bank, which therefore now narrows the bank's exposure to ten percent in their mind. So this, for them this is a good enough product at this point, right? So so that kind of a structure in place, NSC has, you know, sort of arrangements with the training partners to ensure that training partners have some skin in the game, which provides some default as well. So the two levels of default provided, all of which create a situation where if the bank feels like a 10% risk, I can take, and they should, otherwise they're not, should not be banking. You know, and the idea is to just give that impetus to the <coughs> banks to, I mean, start thinking about this product, right, and hopefully they will make it commercially, it will become commercially attractive for them and then the default guarantees don't need to exist. I mean, that is the ultimate goal. And one more point, to to priority sector lending, this is becoming one of the big topics, vocational education. So I think this is going to be more common with banks than you think. Yes. yes. But if you look at global experience, right, uh, and see which countries actually, or banks in which countries are actually making such loans, there are very few such examples you will find. So unless Indian banking system is somehow very different than the global banks, uh, how they operate, right? On an accurate basis to such large numbers, 
as it's opposed like, to doing one pilot, which is a different sort of. I, I think you're there. right. The jury still out whether this will work or not. The point is that the bank is not going to make this one by one. They're going to have a partnership with training partners who are essentially distributors of the loans. Points for the loans in this one. So therefore, the transaction cost you're talking about, which microfinance carries one to one, that's different, right? So, but I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I have no desire See, to say it's that. From a banking it's product it's terminology perspective, it's still uncollateralized loans. You know, whether it's to training institutes or to, so that's and that's the key. And that's the default clarity comes in there. Otherwise, I'm sure without the default clarity of this wouldn't happen. And internationally, you know, most of the models that work, Shantanu is also that they're all very regulated and government funded, by and large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially yes. locations. So yeah. There isn't a single country where it is a learner driven. I think bankers would not be able to do this in a large scale for simple reason that, okay, disbursement of loan is not a big issue. Either trade will be of 30 people at a time and then 30 into 10,000 and then disburse, etc. And uh, till the time of placement of the candidate, you have, you have taken care. But after that, even that administration of it that recoveries from the employer and etc. Is, is a very tedious job. I don't think bankers will be able to do that. It's changing jobs. Yeah, that's policy. where bankers are actually using it. Right? Then what right, it so comes back to? Then what, what is So as a systemic thing, right, it is possible for banks to do it. Right now, for example, in training, in, if you look at the training value chain, right, there are parts which training providers outsource. Right? Or keep in house content development. Yeah, that is okay. Right? So, uh, so for example, one bank that we are working with with is actively seeking to outsource this this function. Right? Which makes their model then uh, viable. So why are education loans working or not working? Because this uh, you know eighty percent people get graduate degrees don't get jobs. Right. The education loans seem to be going on banks are willing to accept them. Is it because they because they're very collateralized. It's collateralized. So no, 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 the background of the people they who get it's illegal. If a bank officer who says I'll take collateral to Leslie Polak and it's actually illegal. No, no, no. See, no, 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 Nobody takes a loan to do a BSc or a BA because they are virtually free in every college in the country. And the other guys who are not getting jobs. Engineering, medical college and good quality MBAs, uh, the risk goes down substantially for a loan because most of them do end up with jobs. Then you add, add a personal guarantee and and other thing they check is, uh, they, by the way, they, they want two people to give guarantees, it's not one person. So it's not just your father, you need to go and get somebody else to give a guarantee. And and they also ask the income proof of the guarantor. So they have a fairly safe mechanism behind it. a simple it. test you can do. At least if you're talking about somewhat of the middle and the bottom of the pyramid section. Just go ask the bank, how many of the trainers will they give bank accounts for? How many of them will they open bank accounts for? As someone who spent a year with Unique ID's financial inclusion program, I can tell you this is the only problem you're trying to solve. Banks don't, want, don't even want to open a bank account. Forget loans. No, no, no. Yeah. Two questions. Yeah. So, quick question to training providers. So, the big risk in a loan pro product is the you know, dropout risk. But a loan program is a service. I mean, a training program is a service. It's like it's not like a ten thousand rupee product that the guy takes away and runs away. So, I just want to understand. Let's say somebody gets into the program and drops out in a three weeks time. What is the cost incurred by the training provider? Let's say it's a ten thousand rupee program. What is the cost? It's not going to be 10,000 rupees, right? Because they haven't spent, but it's not going to be zero either. Because that would really help you understand how you structure your defaults and risk. 20 to 30 percent is the cost of acquisition. Yeah. So that's the cost of acquisition. And um, my question is to all panelists. In some sense, we're all thinking about placements, jobs, and that's, that's the segment we're talking about. And this 500 million target, this is going to be a very, very small part of that target. So what about those who are going into self-employment? What about those? Well, we shouldn't have to. We should be really agnostic where they go after that, as long as they repay or What instruments work for them? And See, how do we one finance? one basic question is that if the training is effective, ideally they should get into the next economic uh, orbit, as may, I may say. And if they're going to get uh, more money, they should be able to invest a little bit in their own training, right? So ideally, just uh, as you thought. If you can't get them to the next level, they'll stop paying anything. So getting access to finance, I, I, I think is a simple issue. You just 
let them decide how much risk they want to take and where can they reach after taking that particular risk. No, no, that's fine. But what instruments work for is, is the question I'm asking. So for example, your loan product is <coughs> shifting the list risk to the employer, then you've got, you know that it's got to be place jobs. But you're excluding an on mass so, category. Yeah, so you're you right. I, at least I don't have an on mass set. <coughs> but maybe that's where the, the, the voucher or the subsidy model comes in. That's so, really so, so basic, very few ways that I can think of. I think in this kind of a se setup, maybe you can uh, comment. I think I think the voucher or default guarantee, what you're just doing is taking a part of the default. In voucher, you're going up to 100 percent, or otherwise you're just coming down to 30, 40, or 50 percent in between. So, so depending on the vulnerability of the students, like if you go to northeast, for example, you can just up the default guarantee, or certain areas you can just take it to 100 percent and call it vouchers. I think very nicely, nicely targeted the lending. I think that is what the <coughs> requirements are. And foundations can, rather than just giving away hundred rupees, if they can spend some time in getting such structures worked out, I think it will be much more effective. Maybe each one of you can give your viewpoints about uh, how foundations basically should be targeting uh, their skill development missions or programs that they are trying to execute. <coughs> what do you think will be the best way for foundations basically use their money in skill development? Uh, programs and how can they get involved into uh, financing students if they I, I think my view is that, um, I mean, uh, it's sustainability, right? I mean, for foundations to be just giving in money and letting it just get uh, skill X number of people when that same money can be used to skill multiple X, right, through a sustainable model, I think that is very important. And Animesh, uh, I just agree with the point that you made initially, which is to say that, you know, uh, if at all this money needs to be uh, given in a grant mode, just put it into a fund, fund which is which can allow it to be used in a sustainable manner, right? So that more people can be reached out to. I mean, that's uh, in my sense a small intervention that can be made. So in my view, to address the, the self-employment market, I think non necessary credit is an important requirement. For some, you know, things credit may not be required. It's only a matter of what kind of training, what quality of training, <coughs> and where you are delivering that. So that's an infrastructure issue. Uh, not necessarily uh, loan is required, because that person may be interested to invest 3-4 thousand rupees and get trained for that. So in, in cases where it is important, I think something like my microfinance can play a very good role. So the assumption here is the bankers, anyhow, again, they want to use for microfinance to for recovery. It, it's like, like, you know, basically, uh, it's a duplication of it. A lot of foundations there. If we want to get one pilot worked out, what do you think <laughs> yeah. they should be? Uh, no, I think. Yeah. I think yeah. foundations. I think most of these foundations are, um, are you know, encouraged by corporate bodies themselves. And all the time we talk about the trainings, uh, you know, uh, promote them from a business perspective of the companies. And we, we very often we don't find the central road to the employer in the entire process. So for, this value chain. So foundations, you know, uh, on account of their origin, probably can effectively partner with some of the industries and encourage them to play a central role in training. Say an industry can open a training center in its own places and run a more effective training, which is directly relevant to them as well as uh, more valuable to the, uh, to the student. So we, we can think of uh, models like that, you know, which can by themselves become models for all of these so the foundation which is, is say, comes out the same as government, right? Uh, so the vouchers is a tool through which you can use public funds or could be third party funds, could be foundation funds or anything else. Right? I think issue there to me is two things. And one thinking about the funding of the trainee and secondly funding about the can we figure out funding the employer who then provides on the job training. Right? So many Western countries of course have the program where employers get subsidy for providing on the job training. So that you're solving that huge problem of uh, matching. Right? So employer finds the right person that they think is a person for the job and provides the training on the job right? and gets subsidized, uh, subsidized, gets subsidized for that cost of the training. So there are different ways of thinking about how a voucher could work uh, other than just providing a voucher to a particular, uh, to the trainees. My point actually, I was thinking when uh, somebody mentioned about ISB, uh, that if you think of ISB, what does a degree, MBA degree from ISB do for you? <laughs> and and it's in academic terms, the signaling device. 
basically signaling to a prospective employer that you have certain capacities, uh, certain skill levels that you have developed, right? An MBA from ISB could be working for McKinsey, could be working for uh, TCS, could be working for some coal, uh, coal India, right? Or CCS, right? <laughs> and doing very different things, right? So there's no one thing that MBA does, right? So the degree is actually a signaling device. So what I was thinking is, is it possible to think of something similar for vocational training? Are there ways of creating signaling devices that tells the prospective employers that I'm a better guy for you, even though I don't know carpentry myself today. But if you hire me, and if you teach me how to do carpentry, I'll be a better carpenter for you than the guy who knows carpentry today. Right? So thinking about going one down level, right? Because not thinking about people and matching them to particular training and the employers. But what MBAs do? I mean, MBAs and all the other higher level education institutions basically provide signals. So I think of a signaling device of that kind for vocational training. Yeah, but these are exactly the people who in fact, signal that they're not very good. Uh, most of the people, from what I understand, uh, most of the unemployed are those who've been to lower rung institutions and are unemployed. Uh, so it's, you know, w it, there's no better signal. I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, right? The, 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 in some sense, you've signaled that you weren't good enough, right? So to now uh, figure out, now we can figure out what signal that can they provide uh, to potential employers that look, we have some capabilities, I don't know a certain skill. Uh, I think it's a long shot. Uh, just looking at the population we're, we're thinking about, right? Actually, that's part of the research. I think I, since they're talking about ISB, maybe there's a... Yeah, ISB, those poor... How can you think about... Actually, I'd say that's very possible, and that's a very good model to be following. What, what the, the lack, the, the issue that comes in leading to that is having employers and in industry understand the competencies and the manpower planning that they need. That's where government money really needs to go into, into manpower planning and to understanding what the competencies and job descriptions, and I don't like the term job description even, it's an opportunity brief, uh, but that's where the money really needs to be spent. And then industry needs to get their skin in the game. Like it seems here there's a lot of uh, complaints about uh, the fact that these training providers are all um, kind of stranded in their own spaces. It's industry that should be stepping in here. And there's glorious models all around the world where we're seeing this occur. You take the CTC, uh, British Airways, and uh, Lloyd's TSB ar arrangement, where essentially all the training for new pilots, and it's different in many ways, it's high ticket training understood, but there are parallels that can be drawn. Basically, all the training, the training institute underwrites and guarantees any student entering the program will graduate from it. They do that through very selective uh, entry processes. Um, BA basically underwrites the loan from TBS, but any applicant that joins them. BA has to give manpower planning and competency requirements and values requirements to CTC. So basically they're outsourcing the entirety of their onboarding process as well as the training process. And then in the third stage, basically the bank, therefore by underwriting rather than paying for it, industry is effectively not taking that on their balance sheets which means it's a good thing for them, especially in high ticket training or high volume training. And then the banks basically have a guaranteed return on the investment from the company or the industry itself, rather than from the individual students, uh, which they're much happier with receiving as well. And that, that's one simple example of where it's been used very effectively. Last three years, CTC resources and BA have been absolutely fabulous. Does uh, private enterprise in the UK do this? Because clearly a lot of these are, I mean, do, do private companies in the UK do this? Well, uh, as with this example, yes, obviously they do. Uh, the scale at which they're doing that is increasing. Uh, but it can't happen unless the manpower planning and the competency understanding for job role descriptions within the organization is highly developed. Not just developed, but highly developed. And that's where governments, I work with the government of Abu Dhabi in consulting on their piece, on the entirety of their new vocational framework. And the basic first step there is, is working with employers and working with industry so they can define the needs, they can provide the workforce planning and the requirements that the government needs. They then tie that in with the government objectives and the industries that they want to put more investment into. And, and then we basically, uh, we're creating entire new vocational frameworks on the basis of that. Um, it only took them two years to get their NVQ framework together. Like, in essence, I know we've been fighting here in India for what, the last 16 years of to try and get the National Vocational Framework into place. Um, but uh, it, can, it can be done relatively speedily, and it needs to be done uh, because that ties in very closely with industry's requirements and industry, helping industry to understand what it is that it really needs. 
uh, sorry, human capital goods. This is a complex and difficult matter, and it needs government to help, at least, and organizations like ISB and training organizations to help industry really understand what it is they're going to need. I think just for the benefit of uh, this room, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, uh, this initiative is actually being taken in the form of you know, sector skill councils which are getting created for every sector. And these are largely industry bodies which are uh, who are responsible for doing you know, all that you're talking about, which is you know, defining the occupational standards for that particular sector, you know, defining what is the standard in terms of training organizations you know, who will be um, uh, up to a certain level accrediting those training organizations. And Path, to your question on what is the signaling that happens Right, um, I think the sector skill council certification will be a signal because you know this is industry certification. Industry is going to uh, be saying that look, these are training providers we are comfortable with because they are training up to a certain standard. Everyone graduating from those training institutes, we are willing to absorb potentially at higher salaries. Right, so it is in some sense a signal mechanism which we, which is going to come into place. Even in the economic situation now, I've been to organisations here like SpiceJet who have guaranteed 20% premium on current salaries for trainees that have graduated under certain skill sets combining competencies, values, both behavioural and technical. They said you create graduates that basically are able to, you know, on a competency basis, prove that they have these competencies and we will provide 20% premiums on current salaries for those people. So even here, the industry is willing to do that as long as the people you're talking to can speak the same language regarding manpower planning and competency frameworks. Last couple of questions, but just one point, I mean, whatever we are talking, that is for that 10% people only. We should keep in mind. Industry is absorbing only 10% of the numbers which we are talking about. So you are still left out the 90%. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. really so don't forget that. This <laughs> question about, uh, just, just clarification, the skill voucher, does it have a placement component that is requirement, or is it just that, you know, I mean, how does the placement thing fit into the skill voucher model you described? Where does it, is the encashment of the voucher depend upon placement? Or? I think that that's why we need these different kind of pilots. So we can have a pilot which doesn't require any placement component. Right? It's just for the training. And that's the end of the story. Like the ISB, this provides you training and then you go and look for a job. They may help you a little bit to find a job, but they are not responsible to find you a job. Right? So that could be one model. Other model could be actually where you include uh, placement as part of the requirement for payment to get paid 60% of the value of the voucher if you just do the training. If you place the person also, then you get the remaining 40% of the value. So voucher actually is in a sense very Flexible. malleable tool that you can adapt to whatever goals you Good set for yourself. Yeah. Very good. And the example you gave here on Kenya and others, all those successful programs, are they also placement connected or they are, how are they implemented today? The only one of them is placement connected. I think the Kenya example actually about the micro enterprises. So they are not for individual trainees, it's more for an enterprise <coughs> subsidy for improving their skill set. Thank you. But given that MSDC will be the funding body for the, for at least for the pilots for the voucher, what, what would be your preference? I mean, is it, should it be employment related or not? Yeah, the MSDC yeah. mandate is employment, so it will be employment. There you go. 70%, that's what they do with 30%. You will refund the voucher. <laughs> Three out of seven get refund anyway, so remaining seven you have to fight for. So actually, it's a very interesting mindset. I mean, a person walks into a training organization thinking that he gets a job. Training organizations have a credibility problem. So if you place 70% and you have to tell the Dallas signer, I'm sorry, we failed with you. Here's your money back, and you think you're coming when you're ready to get trained, we'll try again, right? You will have a waiting list. As against, so you know there are many. You know, it, it's very. You can use different ways, you know, different things, innovative to actually do it. But you should be willing to take the risk, and you should have confidence that you are delivering what industry needs, including the alumni sector. The alumni sector is easier, by the way, than the alumni sector.